So good afternoon and welcome to our virtual program, Decoding Your Child's Allergies. We're very grateful to have Drs. Daniel DiGiacomo and Juan Ravel with us today. So a little bit about our speakers. Dr. Giacomo is a pediatric allergist immunologist at K. Hubnadian's Children's Hospital at Jersey Shore University Medical Center. After completing his fellowship training at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, he moved to South Jersey with his family to start a pediatric allergy immunology program at Hackensack Meridian Health. He has a clinical interest in infant food allergy and primary immunodeficiencies. He also enjoys spending time at the beach with his family during his off time and is an avid New York sports fan. Dr. Juan Ravel is a pediatric allergist at Joseph M. Sanzari's Children's Hospital at Hackensack University Medical Center. He completed his fellowship at the National Institute of Health and he's board certified in allergy and immunology as well as internal medicine. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Ravel. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So it is my pleasure to be here um, with you guys today uh, to talk about allergies. Even though uh, allergies are very common, it can be a little bit complex. And sometimes patients and parents, they, they have questions about, is this an allergy? Uh, what's going on? So hopefully we'll be able to give some, introduc some introduction about the topic and, and, and a broad overview of allergies. So the, the learning objectives are to First, learn to identify what an allergic reaction is, uh, find out if allergies can be better over time or with medical intervention, whether they can get better over time or with medical intervention, address how to treat allergies at home, and walk through allergy testing and some of the challenges that we encounter when we do allergy testing in, in the office. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about, we're going to give a brief overview of allergies. How do I know if I have allergies? How to diagnose the allergies? How allergies are treated? Uh, different type of allergic conditions and uh, when to see an allergist and how do you prepare for the visit and are there additional resources out there? So we'll, we'll give you some information about that. I'll, 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 I'll discuss the, the first uh, part of the, um, of, the talk, of the talk uh, going over the overview of allergies or, and, and the diagnosis of allergies. And then Dr. Uh, Giacomo will go over treatment of allergies and other allergic conditions. Next slide, please. Okay, so allergies refer to having an, an abnormal immune response to normal harmless substances. And some, what, what's normal for some people might be harmful for others. So with allergies, there are different types of allergies. You can have allergies to environmental allergens, things like dust, pollen, pet. Uh, some people have allergies to food. Some people have allergies to insect bites, to medications. And the key here is that an allergen, it's a normally harmless substance that for some people can cause harm. And the immune system and the response that our immune system has to those allergens can, can vary and the severity can vary. But often what happens is our cells recognize those allergens and then they mount an immune response and they release some substances that cause those symptoms that people get, people with allergies get. It can be sneezing, can be um, high, shortness of breath, abdominal pain. And, and those symptoms can vary, okay? And the reactions to allergens, they can vary also in severity. They can be very mild, like sneezing, itchy eyes, but sometimes they can be very severe, such as is the case in some patients with food allergies or drug allergies, including severe systemic reactions, which we refer to as anaphylaxis. Next slide, please. Okay, how common are allergies? They're very common. Um, as a reference, about 50 million Americans suffer from allergies. It is the sixth most common chronic illness in the United States. And the number and the prevalence of allergies appears to be growing over time. Next slide, please. Um, to, to give you an idea, one in four children in the United States 
reported having a seasonal allergy, eczema or food allergy. That's overall, all different types of allergic reactions. 18.9% uh, of children suffer from hay fever, 5.8% from food allergies, and 10.8% suffer from eczema. Worldwide, the prevalence of food allergies is about 4% in children. And, that's, and it looks like it's been increasing over, over time. Uh, you can see here in the graph that allergies to any condition, about one quarter of the population has allergies to something. Then you have about 90% having seasonal allergies, eczema, 10%, and food allergy, about 6%. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, what causes allergies? That's a very good question, and unfortunately, we don't have a clear answer yet. There are different hypotheses, but what really triggers allergies, or what, what causes someone to develop allergies, it's still not well understood. Genetics do play a role in a sense that families, um, it can run in families. For example, it's more common to a child born to parents who have um, atopy or allergies to become allergic or have allergies, have eczema, asthma, uh, food allergies, uh, environmental allergies. But it doesn't mean that if the parents have an allergy to something specific, that's going to be passed down to their kids. That's, that's not how it works. Uh, we oftentimes see patients who come to the office and say, um, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that I have an allergy to penicillin because my parents had an allergy to penicillin. It doesn't mean that they're going to have an allergy to penicillin or food allergy. Uh, parents who have an allergy to peanuts and they don't give peanuts to the kids because they think they have an allergy to peanuts. Not necessary. I mean, they might have a higher risk of getting allergies, but because the parents are allergic to something doesn't mean that they're going to be allergic to the same allergen. And there is something called the atopic march, and uh, I'll show it in the next uh, next slide. So let's go over the next slide, please. Okay, so the atopic march, there are a group of diseases that we we put under what's called a atopic diseases, or under the umbrella of atopic diseases. And there's something called the atopic march. And what it means is that kids who develop eczema early in life, they're more likely to have other related diseases or other allergic dis disorders. For example, they can start having eczema when they're babies, and then down the road, they, they might have an increased uh, risk of developing food allergies, then asthma, and later on in life, allergic rhinitis or, or, or hay fever. And they don't have to, to get all of those. Some kids with eczema, they never get food allergy. Some kids with eczema, they have asthma. Some kids with asthma, they also have allergic rhinitis, but they're, they're related conditions. And on the left uh, side of your screen, you, you would be able to see a slide that kind of gives us an idea of what, how allergies work or, or, or how it is that we become allergic. Um, the first thing that happens is when we're exposed to the allergen for the first time, and it could be, let's say, pollen, uh, our body, it processes the, the, the pollen. Not everyone processes it the same way. So for some people, they're going to get sensitized, meaning the first time they're exposed, they're not going to get the allergic reaction. They're going to get sensitized. And our body makes antibodies in the same way we have antibodies that protect us against infections, we also make some antibodies that sometimes can, can, cause in, can cause disease. And some of those antibodies are called IgE or immunoglobulin E. It's different from the immunoglobulin G that protects us against infections. But just to make um, a little bit of sense, what happens is patients are exposed or kids, adults, they're exposed to the allergen. Our cells, for some reason, they recognize that harmless substance as foreign, and they make antibodies, IgE antibodies against that specific allergen. So those antibodies are going to go on the surface of some uh, immune cells, and next time, as you can see on the, on, on, on the right, next time we're exposed to the allergen, those allergens, 
they interact with those immunoglobulins and they kind of shake the cells. And then those cells release um, some mediators that cause allergy, like histamine that can make uh, people to have, um, can cause people to have itchy eyes, watery eyes, runny nose. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, there is something called um, the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. This is very complex, and, and, and you don't need to understand the slide there. I mean, you can see there are different pathways, different cells, different substances that, that are involved in, in uh, how people become allergic to something. But there are some hypotheses, and one of those is the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. And basically, what it suggests is that the way the allergens are first introduced into the body can make a difference. For example, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the gut, we have some immune cells that they're specialized. They process the food. So the first time a child eats peanuts, for example, those cells, they recognize the peanut and they build tolerance. They make the immune system build tolerance, meaning the kid learns that that allergen, it's, it, that, that, that food, it's not an allergen, that they can process it and the immune system recognizes it as something normal and they don't get an allergy. Now, on the other hand, um, someone who has, uh, for example, eczema, baby with eczema, they might come across, they might come in contact with allergens like the same food, peanut, through the skin. And because we don't have those cells that are specialized in recognizing those peanut proteins and process them to build tolerance, it might end up um, leading to an abnormal immune response and allergies. And the same can happen through the airway. So that's one of the hypotheses. Now, how do we know if we have allergies? So how do we know if a child has allergies? Uh, yes, the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, well, sometimes it can be very hard because sometimes uh, there, there are many, many conditions that can mimic allergic symptoms. If someone has runny nose, nasal congestion, yes, that can be an allergy. But it can also be um, it can also be an alert. It can also be a viral infection. So, but overall, itchy eyes, runny nose, itchy throat, nasal congestion, watery eyes, those are suggestive of allergies, hives, itchiness. Um, Adverse reactions to foods can be aller allergic reactions, but it can also be intolerances, but vomiting, abdominal pain after eating certain foods, uh, those suggest an allergy as well. Um, swelling, uh, hives after an insect sting, that can also be an allergy. So symptoms can vary, and they're not the same for everyone. But it's important to notice that they're reproducible. For example, someone has an allergy to, to milk, when they drink milk, they get symptoms, and it happens every time they're exposed to that food. Next slide, please. Okay, so here you can have a few images, and those are images showing different type of rashes. Eczema. Eczema, we often refer to eczema as the rash that itch. And eczema is very itchy. It changes. The location of the eczema changes according to age. Babies usually have eczema on their face, their body, but as kids grow older, it can change and can, can, can be located on their arms, behind the knees. That's a type of, of allergy or, or atopy. Yeah. Um, there are different types of allergic reactions. Some, some of those are contact dermatitis, for example. Contact dermatitis is a different type of allergy. The rash doesn't happen right away. It, it takes a while for, for kids to develop, for kids and adults to develop the rash, and it's often contact. For example, um, uh, allergy to metal, like, as we see here, uh, we see someone who has an allergy to earrings, and that can lead to allergic reactions. And hives are very common. Hives, when you see hives, it means that the cells are releasing histamine. That's what we see when we when someone has an allergic reaction. But people can also can have hives without allergies. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and there are other diseases 
where people can have rashes and they have nothing to do with, with allergies. For example, a skin infection on the left, cellulitis. Lyme disease can also cause a rash. Ringworm infection, they can also cause rashes. So it's important to seek medical attention and have someone with expertise take a look at the rash. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, how do we diagnose allergies? There are different ways you can diagnose allergies. Clinical history is key. That's very, very important. Having someone with the expertise listen to what happened, uh, that's, that's very, very important. But then when we, when we have to do the testing, uh, we can do skin testing, a different, different type of skin testing. Uh, usually you get results very, very fast, within 15 minutes, with the what's called uh, skin prick testing. Well, we prick the skin with the allergen that we want to know whether someone has the allergic reaction to or not, or whether someone has the desensitized or not. And within 15 minutes, we can see if there is a well and flare reaction, it means that they have a sensitivity to that allergen. It's not painful, and we prefer kids ahead of time. We tell them what to expect. We, we talk to the parents so that they know um, what to expect when we do this type of testing. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. You can also do blood testing. And uh, remember, in it, remember how I briefly mentioned this IgE, that some people make IgE against some allergens, like, for example, peanut or pollen. Well, we can measure those, and we can measure those in blood. And that's another, another option for doing allergy testing. It's a blood test. It's usually less sensitive than the skin test. The skin test is more sensitive. <coughs> um, an advantage of blood testing is that sometimes uh, patients with allergies, they cannot come off of antihistamines or the medications. And you can do the skin testing. They don't have to stop their, their allergy medication. They can continue the treatment. And you can get some answers. And then once their symptoms are better controlled, you can do the skin testing. So you, you can do both. When there's a question, uh, when the skin testing is not great, you can also do blood work and vice versa. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Sometimes, even after doing extensive testing, you don't have an answer, okay? And, or you know someone who had an allergic reaction and you wanna know whether they have outgrown the allergy. And in those cases, we have something we call challenges. Uh, for example, um, a food challenge involves giving a kid increasing amounts of the food that they either had an allergic reaction in the past or that we don't know whether they're allergic or not to see whether they can tolerate the food. And it's done under very close medical supervision by people with experience on how to treat allergic reactions because there is a risk of having an allergic reaction. And that's the gold standard of allergy diagnosis because it can give you an answer. It can tell you whether someone can tolerate the food, the medication or not. Uh, next slide, please. Here is an example of, of a food challenge, okay? Um, you bring the child to the office, um, you will do this under very, very um, um, uh, close monitoring, and then you start with a small amount of the food. Every 15 to 20 minutes, you increase the, the, the amount of food that they uh, ingest until they have eaten a full serving. And after that, you have to monitor. Keep in mind, allergic reactions, yes, they can happen right away, immediately uh, after ingesting the food or as soon as they put the, the food in their mouth. But sometimes it can take up to two hours for you to see an allergic reaction. There are different types of food allergies. They're not, they're, they're not that common as uh, the IgE-mediated food allergies or immediate allergic reactions, but there are other reactions that take longer. And based on the history, we can decide whether we have to observe and monitor for a longer period of time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Patch testing. Um, remember that slide that showed uh, the rash um, on the earlobe? Well, that was contact dermatitis to methods. That type of allergic reaction, it's very different, okay? And I'll give you an example of 
when we do patch testing, when someone has allergy symptoms right after they're exposed to the allergen, let's say a kid is playing with a pet, with a dog or a cat, and they get itchy eyes, a runny nose, sneezing, you do the skin testing. Within 15 minutes, you, you know the answer, okay? But sometimes people wear um, some jewelry or maybe someone buys a new deodorant and they're wearing the deodorant and they're wearing the deodorant for two, three, four days and they're fine. And on day five, they start to get itchy. Those reactions take time, okay? They don't happen right away. And for those type of reactions, you have to do a different type of test and that's patch testing. You put the patches on the back with the allergens that you want to test and then you leave them there for two days, then you remove them and you read 48 hours, usually 48 hours to 96 hours later to see if there is a reaction. This is very different. It doesn't, doesn't cause closing of the throat, chest tightness. The skin is the only organ involved. Next slide, please. Okay. We have to be careful with what type of test is ordered and what is FDA approved, what is known to have a scientific meaning. Uh, meaning okay? There's some tests, including, for example, IgG testing, for which there's not much evidence um, and it's not recognized by the Allergen Immunology Society to have any utility. And I briefly mentioned that we have some antibodies that protect us against infection. Those are the IgG. I mentioned that we have some antibodies that can cause allergic reaction. Those are IgE. So sometimes we see patients who get allergy testing and they do something that measures IgG. IgG is normal. It doesn't mean that they have an allergy if they happen to have an IgG to something specific. It's different from IgE. IgE we use to test for allergies. Next slide, please. Okay, very good. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Giacomo, who is going to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravel, uh, for that the first wonderful first part of the presentation. So we're going to transition now, uh, instead of kind of how to recognize and diagnose allergy into the treatment of uh, allergies, so acute reactions, kind of long-term um, thoughts about how to, how to retreat allergies, and then talk a little bit about some pearls about some of the specific allergic conditions that we mentioned, and then uh, uh, close up with some, some resources, and then we'll move into some, uh, you know, some of the big questions that were asked. So treatment of allergies, broadly speaking, uh, in order to treat something, you have to know how to recognize something. So I'm going to take us through a couple slides in, in, in regards to acute allergic reactions uh, that affect uh, and affect your entire body and how we recognize that, and then how do we uh, specifically treat that. Next slide. So this is a, a handout. This is a part of if anyone has an uh, anaphylaxis action plan from the FAIR. Uh, society, uh, F-A-R-E, this is uh, gives an overview of some of the symptoms that can be uh, that indicative of an acute allergic reaction. So they can range from mild symptoms, so stuff just like an, an itchy, a runny nose, itchy mouth, maybe one or two highs or some mild nausea to more severe uh, symptoms, which can become life-threatening, include wheezing or swelling or recurrent vomiting or dizziness or just all over body hives. So it's important to recognize all the different systems of the body that can be uh, affected by an acute allergic reaction. Next slide. So just make note, over the, the life course, uh, sometimes allergic reactions can present differently, and particularly in relation to those who are infants or toddlers. Sometimes they have different symptoms or manifestations of having an allergic reaction if it is acute. So this can include things um, of like itching and instead of like you know itching your arm or something like that it can just present like tongue thrusting like sticking and kicking out or just rubbing your eyes over and over again or just pulling on the ears there are things like trouble breathing instead of you know an older child who has like clear wheezing it can just be a little bit of fast breathing that starts off with it could be the first manifestation uh throat closing and uh, the cry of a younger child can change and be much more hoarse, or you have this recurrent crook-like cough and you're concerned there's a more acute allergic reaction happening. 
uh, as I mentioned, blood pressure can be affected for acute allergic reactions. And in younger kids, this can be, uh, you know, just extra sleepiness or, or decreased tone, looking more limp or, or more pale. And then gastrointestinal symptoms in, in, in younger infants and, and toddlers can be manifestations of vomiting or back arching if you're a baby and just uh, a lot of spit up. So it's just good to note that sometimes these uh, manifestations or presentation of acute allergic reactions can change based on how old you are. Next slide. So what, are, what is the, the mainstay of, of uh, treating an acute allergic reaction after you've recognized it? So, you know, if at all possible, we tried to avoid, you know, having an acute allergic reaction to something, but being prepared is always uh, the best uh, means, uh, especially if something accidental were to happen or something unanticipated. So when you think about uh, acute allergic reactions in terms of like food allergy or something we talked about, bee sting allergies, where your whole body can be affected and you can have something called uh, anaphylaxis, which is a systemic whole body allergic reaction, we use something called epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is a medication uh, which helps in, uh, support and reverse some of the effects of the allergic reaction. Uh, and it is typically given through a, an injection uh, with a tiny needle uh, in the thigh. And uh, although there was an FDA approved uh, nasal spray, which we won't go into too much today um, for older adolescents for epinephrine, to note, sometimes after you get treated with epinephrine, you do need require multiple doses. So that's why when the uh, allergist or your primary care doctor sometimes prescribe it, they have just a two-pack, so you have multiple EpiPen. And it's also important to note that if you need this, it's you, it's in a setting of an emergency. So uh, we often, you might be told that you have to call emergency medical services. Another pearl that it comes for treatment of acute allergic reactions that, that require the use of epinephrine is that it's better to treat than, than not treat with this medication because the risk of uh, side effects from epinephrine, I used to say, it's kind of like drinking a cup of coffee and there's a little bit of a pinch. And if it's, it has the potential to reverse any severe symptoms of an acute allergic reaction, then that's obviously much more beneficial. And just one final note um, in the kind of main tenets of treatment is that Antihistamines themselves, if, if someone is having a systemic uh, anaphylactic reaction, don't actually change the course of things. So, you know, epinephrine, epinephrine. So next slide. So I just want to take a little bit extra time here just to review what is that, how do you give epinephrine? Because it, it's such an important medication if it's especially it's prescribed by, by your doctor. So it, Essentially, it comes in a box. Uh, you open up the box, it has a little container. And in the, the epinephrine, uh, it has an auto injector. So you need to re um, remove the safety, uh, which is there's one on the top, and there uh, is sometimes there's one elsewhere. And you have to understand how to hold it. When usually we hold it with our hand, we don't put our thumb over the needle point. Uh, and then, where you, uh, once you have prepared it and got it ready, uh, next slide. You have to know where to place it. So it just typically goes over the thigh. I usually say about halfway up the leg and halfway across over to the middle of the leg. And this can be given over clothing. And then you gently either swing or just put it over and compress until you hear a click. And then you count to three and you remove it. And then as you do remove it, most epi epinephrine uh, injectors will cover the needle, but it's always good to note to make sure uh, it is in case you don't want someone to get poked. You can gently massage the area if you would like, and you should call emergency medical services. All right, next slide. The epinephrine uh, injector that we just showed is not the only one, though. And sometimes if your provider uh, prescribes an epinephrine pack, you might get something different. So there's a whole bunch, right? Some of them, uh, you have to take off the, uh, you know, the packaging a little bit different. Some of them talk to you. Like I said, there is this new uh, nasal spray of epinephrine that is approved for, for older adolescents and adults and should be out on the market uh, fairly soon. Let's keep in uh, note, it, or you might get a different product based on the pharmacy that you use, and it's always good to familiarize yourself with what you have in case you need it. Next slide. So uh, 
I just want to give one more slide on injection of the epinephrine going back to kind of the younger individuals as I, this is a common question that comes up is, you know, how do I, how do I hold my child if they're very young or if they're a baby and I need to give epinephrine? So there's a couple of nice um, uh, you know, uh, articles or studies that look at what the best way is. I just pulled some pictures from there. So there's many different ways you can hold uh, your child, if especially if they're younger, if you're by yourself um, or you're with someone. So some suggestions are is you can just lie down uh, on, on a flat surface, kind of comfort your child um, and kind of offer them that it's just going to hurt maybe for a quick second. And then make sure you isolate and secure the leg. And um, if you are alone, you can use your non-dominant hand to hold and then the dominant hand to administer the epinephrine. And uh, the main goal, right, is to make sure that there's not an injury necessarily from injecting it. But usually this is very effective and, uh, and it works for most people. All right, next one. So I just spent a lot of time on management of acute allergic reactions and, uh, you know, specifically systemic whole body reactions and anaphylaxis. But obviously we discussed there's other allergic conditions that have allergic symptoms that aren't necessarily related to that. There are many other treatments uh, that are uh, over the counter or that can be prescribed by your doctor that treat that. This includes things like nasal steroids, like Flonase. Uh, there's nasal antihistamines, the picture not here, but if you heard of Astapro. Ocular antihistamines, some names uh, I see on the left here, like the other day, oral antihistamines like Zyrtec. And even things like nasal saline sprays or nasal rinses from the neti pot can uh, be uh, treatments that may help uh, your child uh, control their as, uh, allergic symptoms and allergies. Uh, just another note too, a lot of, there are a lot of questions about the side effects of some of these medications. In regards to uh, oral antihistamines, there's two different main types of oral antihistamines, and this includes kind of the older ones that make you very sleepy and can have, sometimes make it hard to focus if you uh, in school if you take them during the day. And then there's the newer ones, which are less uh, less sedating and make you less sleepy, but work just as well. And there's fairly good track record for a long-term use of these oral antihistamines in terms of you know uh, general side effects, right, you know cognition, and so on. Sometimes you know you may you may see you can see a slight headache or slight abdominal pain, but generally these are very well tolerated and effective. And next slide. So in terms of like how do you think about how do you treat allergies over the long course and nothing acute is happening? Uh, like I said, prevention and preparation are always key. Uh, and it's important to note that there's no actual definitive cure for allergies. Yeah, it, it goes back to we we understand a lot of what you know makes you have an allergy, but not everything. Um, and I think uh, so we, we know how to control symptoms and prevent you know severe complications as as we learn more about this, this more therapies are to come out. So depending on the type of allergy, there, there are some treatments that can, can help over the long term, and this includes a lot of things called immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is a type of medical treatment that reduces your the reactivity to the specific allergy. And uh, we can give immunotherapy in several ways. It can be by a subcutaneous injection. So this is just under the skin, a sublingual uh, treatment, which is under the tongue, oral, which is something you eat. Even something like a biologic therapy, so an injectable medication that kind of modifies things and doesn't involve in, in introducing the allergen uh, at, at all. Next slide. So I just wanted to make one more comment on the natural history of allergies because I think there were some questions uh, related to this. So sometimes the management of an allergy is just to wait and you might grow out of it. So this is particularly pertinent when you think about food. So most young children uh, have a food allergy gets diagnosed early in life. If you have an egg or a milk or a wheat or a soy allergy, you often outgrow it by age five. Less so if you are diagnosed with a peanut allergy or a tree nut allergy, but just keep in mind, uh, a lot of food allergies, depending on the type of food, uh, make you uh, likely to grow out of it. In terms of allergic rhinitis, so seasonal allergies, year-round allergies, most uh, individuals develop this by the time they're adolescent or later in childhood, and it's less likely that you would grow out of it, but still a quarter may. 
Another disorder that I'll mention a little bit more detail in a second, eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, there's no conclusive evidence that remission may occur, although 10% may be able to introduce some foods if they are, have been previously avoiding them. In terms of eczema or atopic dermatitis, most children grow out of this and have, they have a good outcome. And then finally, uh, in terms of asthma, for kids who wheeze at a very young age, the majority actually will grow out of it. There are some risk factors that can uh, um, predict if, if asthma will stay, and this includes family history, having eczema at the same time, being exposed to, exposed to smoke, or having other IgE, these IgE allergic antibodies that are elevated. And if you're an older kid and you have wheezing, uh, still the uh, majority will grow out of it um, as well. Overall, though, there's not a good way to predict who will go out of an allergy or not. All right, next slide. I just wanted to make one other mention about in terms of in the food allergy realm of something called a food ladder. So a, a food ladder, essentially, um, if you take the idea that if you are allergic to something, it depends uh, how the food is kind of manufactured or cooked, because that can change how your body looks at it and how your, uh, your body might react to it. So in, in specifically, for example, let's say egg. If your child has egg allergy and you bake it in a muffin, they may be able to tolerate it. Although I would not use that. Just use, um, this has to be done in conjunction with your allergist. Uh, and then over time, it may be recommended that you slowly get more and more to the original scrambled egg. So uh, this is another consideration uh, of, of management of food allergy that can be done, but this has to be done uh, in conjunction with an allergist, immunologist. Next slide. And then prevention of allergies. There's been a lot of discussion in the media or in the allergy world in terms of early food introduction, if introducing foods early in life can prevent uh, the onset of food allergy. And the general consensus in the allergy world is that you should, uh, after introducing some of the general complementary foods, uh, once uh, your child is developmentally ready, around age four or six months, that so you should start to introduce more highly allergenic foods. And the benefit has definitely been proven in clinical trials, which is what uh, a lot of these recommendations came from. Uh, and there's maybe less conclusive evidence when you just take the population as a whole, but generally it's regarded as a, as a good model. And then there, I mentioned allergen immunotherapy before. There's some, some studies that show that if you uh, have some of these uh, allergic conditions that are associated with the atopic march, when you start something like allergen immunotherapy to pollens or, or dust mite, you might be able to prevent the onset of asthma. All right, and uh, click it one more time. And then just one note on commercial early intervention foods. You may see this a lot as well. Commercial intervention foods uh, refer to things like, like spoonful or, or, or um, uh, specific foods like that, and that they combine all allergenic foods in one packet and make it easy to do early introduction. Uh, and on the face, that, that may sound good, but there are some potential drawbacks or things that should be kept in mind. A lot of these foods, the standardized amount of food in that, in that powder, is, it's not there, it's not standardized, and it might be below the amount that you need to prevent a food allergy. They're often expensive, and they can contain multiple allergens, which can confuse things right, if there's a clinical reaction. All right, next slide. So just really quickly, I'm going to take... a. Uh, 15 seconds for each and run through kind of the other salient points for some common allergic conditions. So if you mentioned allergic rhinitis, this is something where you get runny nose and sneezing and sinus pressure, sometimes worsening asthma, uh, and it can be seasonal uh, caused by pollens or it can be perennial or year round caused by things like pets or dust. Uh, and sometimes you have these symptoms, but it might not be caused by an allergy. It can be uh, triggered by strong odor, pollution, or smoke. And treatment includes avoidance or some of the other symptomatic treatments we talked about, like NS beams and nasal sprays. All right, next slide. And there is food allergy. So there's a ton of things you can talk about food allergy, but the main pearls is if, you, if you're concerned, it's generally something that's reproducible. It's immediate onset within minutes, and most of the individuals have a rash. Here on the left, there's a, a nice pyramid of a of a study that showed the general risk factors for food allergy. And this includes if, if your child has moderate or severe eczema or another food allergy. And see down here next to the general population risk is family history. So it might impart some risk of developing a food allergy, but it's not the entire picture. 
And then on the right here is just an overview of the nine major food allergens. Uh, the most common, this includes milk, wheat, egg, soy, um, peanut, tree nuts, sesame, um, and uh, fish and shellfish. Next slide. Another uh, in the realm of uh, that is treated in terms of allergies is drug allergy. So we didn't mention much about this today, but just so you know, uh, a lot of individuals report that drug allergies, specifically penicillin allergy, that many can tolerate it. In fact, there was a, a recommendation by a, a allergist immunologist uh, committee a couple of years ago that said if, if there's a if your child is young and in generally less than five, if you had a rash to amoxicillin, even if it's hives, you should talk to your allergist because you may be able to tolerate it immediately afterwards. All right, next slide. And then there's venom allergy, bee sting allergy, which we discussed briefly. It is it is fairly common, 0.6% of children. Uh, and you can get this from bees, wasps, hornets, or even fire ants. And sometimes the initial presentation can be the systemic allergic reaction. And you might be asked to carry that back in auto injector. If the reaction is very severe, it can be associated with something called mastocytosis. So we always recommend seeing an allergist so they can explain this more and discuss if any other uh, diagnosis is needed, diagnostic steps are needed. For kids who just have a slight rash or a local swelling, sometimes you do not need further evaluation or management if there's a the kids from a bee sting. And you can do allergy immunotherapy to venom, but generally we don't do it in those less than five years of age. Next slide. Uh, another common allergic condition is idiosynthesis epigitis, and this is something that's generally driven by foods, and it, it results in inflammation in the esophagus, which can uh, cause different symptoms. So, for example, in a young infant, it can cause poor feeding, or as you get older, difficulty swallowing, cutting foods into small pieces, using a lot of water to wash down food, and so on. And there are several different treatment algorithms that have been developed here, uh, food avoidance, uh, swallowed steroids, using uh, antacids. Uh, or a medication called Dupixent. Uh, and um, and it can be, there's a lot of discussion that goes into this. So it's usually in conjunction with a gastroenterologist and an allergist. Next slide. Uh, and I think this is the last one on allergy conditions. So food protein induced enterocolitis, so FPI. The, uh, the cause of this is not well understood, but it's thought to be a non IgE. So it's still an allergic reaction, but it's not in the immediate type. Or a food triggers activation of the immune system, which results in vomiting. Uh, excessively and sometimes low blood pressures and paleness. First diagnosed in infants, but usually you grow, grow up by age three, two or three. And like I said, presents with repetitive vomiting one to four hours eating of food. They're the most common triggers. And there are some other entities because uh, such as chronic and typically typical FIs, which can present a little bit differently. Uh, but we often say just discuss it with your allergist if you're concerned. And there's a uh, certain cross-reactivity activity between foods as well. Treatment uh, is Zofran at home and trying to get as many healthy foods in the diet because we don't want you to have to take out too many foods out of fear. Then maybe meeting with a dietitian and doing a challenge several years later. Next slide. All right, so this is just the some things of when to see an allergist. If any of these conditions uh, are pertinent, um, you can we feel, always feel free to ask for the allergist consult. Uh, if any of the symptoms are chronic or not responding to over-the-counter medications or impacting quality of life, there are other reasons to go search an allergist. And just remember, when you go to the allergist, they may want to do skin testing, so avoid antihistamines if possible beforehand. Next slide. Here are some resources. If you search the American College of Asthma, Allergy Asthma and Immunology, or the American Academy of Allergy Asthma and Immunology, FAIR, Allergy and Asthma Network, these are um, kind of some societies that have a lot of great patient um, and family resources. Next slide. And uh, on these websites, I have handouts, but they also have uh, interesting. Like you can you can go and do decision making tools to see if you're a pro, if you need allergy shots, or you can they have a virtual allergist that you can ask kind of like rudimentary questions and stuff. But at, at the very least, it's kind of fun and cool. But you might learn some stuff too. All right. Next slide. Uh, so we have about. 10, 10 minutes we run through. I, I we tried to address some questions that we worked into the presentation, and we have a couple additional here, and then hopefully have a final couple minutes um, uh, to address any other outstanding questions that came up during the presentation. So I, I'll go first with this question, and then Dr. Ravel and I will alternate um, thereafter. So first question: I have a toddler with sneezing, runny nose, and watery eyes from the spring through the fall. Is it normal to have symptoms for this long? 
So, you know, the first thing is if you think there's a seasonal relationship with this, seasonal allergic rhinitis, first, if uh, you have to be usually over two years of age because you need to be sensitized, right? We talked about seeing these allergens, which then cause that immune response. Um, so uh, if, if, you, if you meet that criteria, then you ask, um, is it possible to be allergic to, you know, all the different seasons, which it can be. So it's classic thing. So in the spring, you have tree pollens, and in the summer, you have grass, and in the fall, you have your weeds and stuff like that. The other things, too, that if you're having long-term symptoms, it could be more perennial allergic rhinitis, something like this might, uh, which can, symptoms can wax and wane in regards to seasonal changes, too, in humidity. Or it might be one of those other um, other entities we mentioned, such as chronic rhinitis that's triggered by other irritants, or just a little bit of that mixed in with some viral infections. So um, it, it can be one of the uh, one of many different things. We usually just say, you know, if you're if it's unclear, just go see an allergist and be able to help elucidate it further. Okay, so. Uh, another question that was submitted was, how do allergies handle skin testing in children with autism spectrum disorder? Uh, overall, the goal is to ensure the testing process is as stress-free as possible, okay? And at the same time, you need to have um, accurate results. So you, there are different things that we can do. We provide a calm, supportive environment. Uh, we try to explain in detail the procedure. Sometimes you have to use uh, visual aids, um, some distractions, sometimes air, like an iPad, um, letting them listen to some music. And when the procedure is done, you can offer some rewards or incentives like a lollipop, stickers. Uh, it's, it, you, you need to have, you need to involve the parents. That's very important. Uh, parents are usually involved in the process. They provide reassurance and support to their child. And we need a collaborative approach. Uh, so we need to have our staff. It, it takes, it might take longer. And some cases are harder than others, but that's the basic approach that we, we do when we do allergy testing to kids with autism. Next slide. Okay, so the next question is, uh, is, what is the relationship, if any, between eosinophilic esophagitis and seasonal allergic rhinitis? Excellent question. Uh, and we know some about this, but it's mostly just describing what happens. So definitely some of these air, air allergens, like the dust mites and pollens, can cause eosinophilic esophagitis flares and even things like food impaction. Uh, and we know that those with eosinophilic esophagitis are more likely to have other atopic or allergic conditions like allergic rhinitis and asthma um it's you know um it, it's we think we know that you, you think you get exposed to the allergen and kind of cause that allergic reaction and response into the esophagus but it, we don't 100 percent know exactly why that occurs uh, just things to keep in mind though are that if if your child has eosinophilic esophagitis and they are suffering from allergic rhinitis symptoms, we say this should be con uh, controlled as much as possible, especially if a biopsy is coming up because you can get uh, conflicting results or, or clouded results. So, great question. Okay. Uh, can local honey be used to treat allergies? Um, there's some, there, there is no clear evidence that local honey uh, will treat allergies, okay? There are some small studies demonstrating an effect, but there are others that do not. So there, there's some com, some conflicting literature out there. Uh, the pollen in honey, it's not typically um, what you're allergic to. And also the amount of pollen in honey, it's it's not much, okay? So uh, poll, the pollen incorporated into honey can cause allergic reactions in very, very circumstances. Uh, it's reasonable to try honey, but it's unlikely to have any true effect. The most important thing is to uh, seek medical attention and, and then have a physician decide or, or give you some advice so that you can take, uh, make an informed uh, decision. And I treat allergies with our health medicine. So now that we talked about avoidance, like there's different techniques to avoid your allergens, and that can be one of the first recommendations to help treat allergies. Uh, so 
hopefully that is effective, but not always. So if, if a medication or some other intervention is required, there's, there's things such as saline rinses, which can help wash out allergens, uh, which can also be helpful. And then there's the whole field of complementary therapies. And they, there are studies, and, and this has been looked at in terms of allergic disease, and some actually do have a positive impact. Although a lot of the data, a lot of the well, things they looked at were done in adults, so um, caution should be used in, in children. Uh, here's an excellent resource. Uh, if you if you search NCIH, it's a, a run by the NIH, the National um, Institutes of Health, and they have lots of information on specific therapies that are complementary and alternative and whether they're safe, how they can be used in children and, and so on. All right, thank you <clears throat> doctors very much. I believe we had two other questions that were submitted that we can try to get to real quick. Um, the first one is, please explain more about if and how allergies can cause an asthma attack. Okay, so it's, um, when someone has asthma, there are different triggers, okay? Uh, people with asthma, they can they can have an acute asthma exacerbation if they have uh, a common cold. Okay, uh, maybe a kid without without asthma, they get a common cold and they go through it. Maybe have a little bit of a cough and that's it. Someone with asthma, they can have more severe symptoms and have what, and have what we call reactive airway disease, meaning they can get asthma because of the underlying uh, infection, the common cold. Uh, not everyone who has asthma gets asthma because of allergies. But there is a large group of people who have asthma and they also have allergies and those allergens, they can trigger an asthma attack. For example, someone with allergy to, to cats and their asthma might be very well controlled, but they go out and they play with a cat and then they can get a cough, shortness of breath, wheezing. So here it's very important to know what people are allergic to. That's why skin testing or allergy testing is important because you can learn to identify what you're allergic to. And based on that, you can, uh, you, you can put some measures in, in, into place like avoidant measures. Sometimes you can do um, immunotherapy. There are kids who have dogs and the family, they don't want to get rid of their dog and they have allergy, they have asthma when they're with their dog. And some things that you can do if they're old enough, you can do immunotherapy or allergy shots so they can tolerate what they're allergic to. They can build tolerance. So in brief, uh, not everyone with asthma has asthma symptoms just because of allergies. But if a child has asthma and allergies, those allergens can trigger an allergic reaction, including asthma. All right. Thank you very much, doctors. That was very helpful and informative. So at this time, we are going to wrap up today's program. So I just want to thank you all, too, for taking time to join us today. Please watch your email for an evaluation of the program. We hope that you'll take time to fill it out, that we want to hear from you, and also let us know if there's other topics that you're interested in. Um, the link of the recording will also be included as well. Um, this wraps up our Parent Guardian series for 2024. We do have one scheduled for January, Healthy Weight, Healthy Lifestyle on January uh, 23rd of 2025. And then you can always visit our website um, to find out other uh, programs that are coming up. So definitely be on the lookout for um, more of our Parent Guardian series um, in the coming year. So again, I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you doctors for a very informative presentation and I hope you all enjoy your day. Take care. Thank you.